There's an olive tree on the Greek Isle of Crete that was planted over 2,000 years ago that's still producing olives to this day. So perennials are what are my favorite because I don't want a garden and most of you don't want a garden. I mean, as far as living in the soil and working hours per day, you don't want to be a farmer. But perennial edible landscapes, like the Garden of Eden type of idea where there's just literally food growing everywhere, that's the idea that we are demonstrating around the world and it's going viral. Are you curious about discovering ways of making your life better? Then welcome to my podcast. I'm Bob Nickman and this is The Exploding Human. Listen in while I talk with all kinds of people in the fields of personal growth, health and healing, alternative therapies, psychology, spirituality, environment, and the future. I'm looking for those answers that make life better for everyone. You'll meet cutting edge practitioners, doctors, artists, filmmakers, business people, and those who have overcome challenges. The brave, the curious, anyone who's out there helping us humans to explore, expand, and explode. Hey, welcome to The Exploding Human. My name is Bob Nickman. My guest today is Jim Gale. He is the founder and CEO of Food Forest Abundance. And we're going to be talking about how anyone can grow their own food. More about that in a second. First of all, I'd like to invite you to visit my website, theexplodinghuman.com. Over there, you can see photos of my guests, synopses of the episodes, listen to episodes, little bio on myself, a donate button if you'd like to support the show. Thank you very much. There is also a YouTube channel, The Exploding Human with Bob Nickman, Ed with Bob Nickman, and you can listen to the episodes there. And there is also the Exploding Human Facebook page. Lots of places to listen to the show. As I said, my guest is Jim Gale. Jim is a super interesting guy on a real fantastic mission. One of the things that I loved about this interview was all the incredible information that uh, Jim has about uh, the history of food and how uh, we have changed to a centralized uh, food system that is not really working anymore. Did you know, because I did not, there's 40 million acres of lawns across the United States. That is a lot of land that could be used for people to grow their own food. And with food prices soaring and uh, scarcity, all kinds of things that uh, have created problems with uh, people getting proper nutrition and even enough food. Jim has created this company, which can help anyone to create a food forest in their own backyard or neighborhood to feed many people and to feed many people nutritiously. Jim's going to talk about all that and his vision for the future with this company and how you can participate. So here he is. This is Jim Gale. Good morning. It's so great to meet you finally, and uh, I can't wait to talk about this. Oh, Bob, thank you. It's a pleasure. I love sharing this message of freedom with everybody that will listen. Well, And I love that you're talking about this as freedom, because it really is that. And it's, why don't we start with the term permaculture? Because I was really fascinated by that whole concept uh, as I'm looking out my, uh, my backyard, uh, you can't see it on this virtual background, but I'm, there's a lawn in my backyard that I didn't want. Yeah. <laughs> and it's, and it's, you know, it looks nice. Mm-hmm. But that's about it. Yeah. So let's talk about, well, here's, here's something you stated. How many How many acres of lawn are there in the United States? Something like 40 million acres? Yes. 40 to 50 million acres of a monochromatic plant that produces no good smells, no food, and people think it looks nice, and it's been like a competition in our world. Who can have the nicest fucking lawn? Excuse my language. It's, <laughs> it is the, the foundational tool of enslavement, quite literally, and I can demonstrate that. When we Great. transition... 30, 40, 50% of the edges of our lawn into food forests, perennial edible landscapes that actually take less maintenance than a lawn, we change the world. We literally wipe out 
mass extinction and deforestation and cancer trends and diabetes trends and heart disease trends, all of the tools of enslavement can be reversed simply by using our lawns wisely, our yards. That is absolutely um, incredible, and it's heresy. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. This is a revolution, the peaceful revolution. It, yeah. When you think about um, the mindset of an entire culture that thinks having a really cool lawn, whatever the heck that means, is, is a good idea, and, and you see it you know, all across the country, lawn, 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 gardener, 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 chemical, chemical, chemical to keep it the way it is, yeah. noise, pollution from blowers, um, an immense use of water that produces just lawn. I mean, I think about the and, water. And worse alone. than all of that is the poisons. The lawn uses more poisons than any other freaking crop. And these poisons go into our bodies, our waterways, they are, they are destroying the microbiome that makes up the foundation of life on our planet, the soil, right? Because there's no scientist in the world that understands the communication between plants, the divine, natural, God-given, however you call it. It's way too big for us to understand. And yet we use poisons that kill a litany of things. And that is that's the that's just wickedness. And there are people who know this. Henry Kissinger back 50 years ago, he said, if you want to control nations, control oil. If you want to control people, control the food supply. This strategy has led to a systematic dismantling of the family farm and the use of poisons throughout our world. So once we expose this truth and we start using these resources and actually building life, we gain our freedom on every level. It's it's an amazingly simple solution to a very complicated problem. Uh, it's it's very simple. It's almost too simple to grasp for a lot of people that, because it it involves changing a belief system. That's the heart. That's probably the most difficult task. How do we do that? How do we change people's worldview about this thing in a way that they're not threatened? And they think it's their own idea. <laughs> I love it. I love it. And you say it's a difficult task. And, and changing a belief system is, but it's a lot more difficult not to, right? So when you look at like this idea of convenience, is it convenient to go to McDonald's? Well, let's step back from the five-minute delivery of your food. And let's look at what that's going to do to your body over the next two hours, five hours, lifetime. Is it convenient? Does it is McDonald's inexpensive? It's the most expensive meal you've ever had in your life by far because of what it's going to cost your life. And that's, again, a lot of those foods are grown with poisons, right? So how we do this is we inspire. We demonstrate, we inspire, and we empower by showing what's possible. And this is where I'm, I'm so excited to get to this next phase of this massive thing, this movement that we're creating. And, and I also want to give credit to the, to the pioneers who, a lot, like a lot of pioneers, they've got the arrows in the back. People are saying, oh, you're crazy. That doesn't work and stuff. They have proven this in every zone pretty much except for the polar ice caps. They've pr proven that this term permaculture, which is what you originally asked about, it was designed by Bill Mollison. And, and I believe he and maybe David Holmgren came up with the name. And it stands for permanent culture. Right? So it's a very, it's a sustainable agricultural design science that when we put these design pieces to use, it's, it's, again, it makes sense on every level. It's less maintenance than a lawn to grow fruit trees and berry bushes. You know, in the interview that I'm going to post, uh, it's a video that you did. You, were ta you asked him about the forest outside of his studio and how much he has to go out there and uh, you know, work in that forest to sustain it. And he goes, well, not at all. <laughs> there you go. And your, and your point is, yes, that's correct. If we design a, a, a proper 
uh, environment, depending on the, uh, the area that you're designing it in, that's suitable to that climate and that soil and all that stuff, that it will be sustainable mostly on its own without, with very little uh, difficulty other, you know, I guess the, the real work is just planning the new stuff. That's where, and that seems like it would be more fun than anything. And guess what? That's the difference between a perennial edible landscape and an annual garden, right? An annual are plants that you plant once, you put the seed in the ground or the shoot or the spud, and then they grow, you harvest, and then you plant again. Perennials are things that last two or more years, but most of them last for generations, and some of them literally last for millennia. There's an olive tree on the Greek Isle of Crete that was planted over 2,000 years ago that's still producing olives to this day. So perennials are what are my favorite, because I don't want a garden, and most of you don't want a garden. I mean, as far as living in the soil and working hours per day, you don't want to be a farmer. But perennial edible landscapes, like the Garden of Eden type of idea where there's just literally food growing everywhere, that's the idea that we are demonstrating around the world, and it's going viral. Yeah, I'm looking at my backyard, and I'm thinking, well, if I, if I call Jim and he comes over, what is that going to look like? Let's, let's walk through an actual visitation and implementation of what you're talking about. Now, I'm in um, Los Angeles and I'm about 10 blocks from the beach. So underneath the topsoil is probably fairly sandy soil, but it's still, you know, it's it, the first house I had, which was about the same distance from the beach, uh, was owned by people who had uh, immigrated from Cuba. So they had uh, peach tree, plum tree, fig tree, and uh, I forget the other one. There was another one. And so when I moved into that house, the, there there were trees that were fruiting uh, already because they had lived there for 30 years. Yeah. So it's possible at least for that. And they had other stuff too, but that was, so what would, what would you do? You come over to my house and you go, Hey, Bob, it's Jim. Yeah. <laughs> Cause we're friendly. And then you, what do you do? You analyze the soil, you look at square footage, you look at trees. Yes. Tell, tell me how that goes. So I just want to jump real quick to Cuba. So Cuba was subsidized by the USSR, by the, the Soviet bloc. And in 1989, that crumbled and all of the funding to keep that communist country went bye-bye overnight. The Cubans started to starve. They went from completely unsustainable, centralized food production that was shipped to them to all of a sudden, within 20 years or 15 years, they became one of the best food producing countries per capita in the world because of necessity. So mm. that's what's happening now. Venezuela, they're gardening like crazy. The World War I, you had Victory Gardens. World War II, you had Liberty Gardens. But this is the next wave, and this is the big one. Because now we understand the technology of permaculture, and it's our job to spread this, this freedom technology. So we would come over to your house, and we would just observe your land. We'd say, okay, the first thing that we want to do in your area is probably catch and store water, right? In, in almost anywhere in the world in permaculture, that's one of the primary first things to do. Because water is the foundation of life, of the system. Right? In some areas like a rainforest, you don't need to worry about that. Um, you just need to have redundancy in your systems. So we would find either several ways to do that. One of the best ways is by creating little ditches on contour. Now, they could be, they could be a foot wide and five inches deep, or they could be you know, uh, five meters wide and two meters deep. Depends on the area. In fact, there's a video by Jeff Lawton called Greening the Deserts of Jordan. And in this video, he goes into one of the most inhospitable growing climates in the world. That's a salt flats, lowest place in the world, hot, miserable, no rain for years sometimes. They started digging these big swales and filling them in with mulch. And over the years, they turned this desert into an oasis. The local agriculturalists couldn't believe it. They found mushrooms. They had never seen mushrooms in their country. And they started looking through the mulch and all of a sudden there's mushrooms in there. So we would start by catching and storing water and building soil. Now, how we build soil, a lot of times we use um, some sheet mulching if you already have grass 
And then on top of that, we lay a little bit of soil, some amendments like biochar, and then we put layers of mulch on top. The layers are important because the mulch stops the sun and the wind and the rain from directly hitting the soil. That's what caused the, the dust bowls of the Great Depression. Desertification is caused when you take and you bear the soil to the elements because that's not natural. So we do everything we can to mimic natural systems, mimic nature, because nature's already figured all this out. We just have to get out of her way. Well, I was just thinking about when I was a kid and I used to walk in the, in the woods and there, it wasn't soil, it was leaves and twigs and other, and, you know, fallen logs. There, it wasn't bare soil. Right. You had to dig down and find, you know, cool stuff crawling in there. Yeah, yeah, that's exactly Okay, right. so you start, you start with that and then you have a certain amount of land, square feet, and how much can you grow in, you know, 10 square feet, 20 square feet. And how do you do that? I know there's raised beds, but then that, you said some, something in uh, on your website about towers, um, layers, hydroponics. There's so many different things that you can do. Yeah, there are so many different things. Now, I went through a process um, of learning what is the simplest way. In fact, Bill Mollison, I, when I first learned what's going on in the world back in 2007-ish, I didn't believe it. I went through a period of cognitive dissonance and I really went down the rabbit hole full speed. I had sold a mortgage company, did about a billion three in volume, and I, was, I had time. Some days I'd spend eight, 10, 12 hours a day researching the problem. And I was going through kind of a crappy time because when you're so focused on the problem, it doesn't feel very good if you don't know the solution. And then I read Bill Mollison's quote, Though the problems of our world are increasingly complex, the solutions remain embarrassingly simple. And I started sobbing and I started focusing on that idea. And a little bit later, I read Victor Hugo's quote, there's one thing stronger than all of the armies of the world. And that is an idea whose time has come. And the idea is in everybody's consciousness. Everybody can describe in glorious detail what this idea is, and yet most of us think it's a utopic fantasy, that it's impossible. The Garden of Eden, and I'm not talking about the religious place, I'm talking about the place where there's abundance everywhere, is not a utopic fantasy. It's literally the next logical step for humanity. It is embarrassingly simple. <laughs> it's, I'm embarrassed just hearing it. It's beautiful, isn't it? And now we know how to go forward. This is the path. So if you were to come to my house, what would you do? I mean, you can't see my house. Yes. I'm looking out the window, but you would, uh, knowing that the what the climate is here. Yes. We'd start you, you would by asking questions regarding what you want, right? That's okay. the number one thing for any customer. What do you, do you want a fancy, beautiful landscape with rock hedges and borders and all these different things? Great. We can do that. And instead of using ornamental plants that have one function typically, and that is beauty. We mm -hmm. use plants that are beautiful, even more beautiful, that also produce other functions like food production, animal habitat, and so much more. And so then we would stack all of the different things. So I'll give you an example. At Galt's Landing, we're building a completely off-grid um, community here. With all, every lot will have its own food, water, and energy systems, completely designed and installed. And we've got a, a starter piece where we've got 700 feet on the ground. It's a circle. It's, it's a small food forest, but we've got 55 plants in that food forest from roots and tubers, gingers and turmerics, all the way up to overstory fruit trees. And it is, we, we've done nothing for a year, no maintenance, nothing. And it's just thriving. Wow. It's amazing. So people just go out in that garden and get some stuff and cook it That's right. or not cook it or eat it raw. Yeah. I mean, I would want, you know, a lot of green leafy vegetables, maybe sprouts, yes. um, some fruit trees, um, that kind of thing. So I've got an idea for you since you brought up some of the types. There are perennial spinaches like longevity spinach and Okinawa spinach and Suriname spinach and many, many more. Some you can turn your fence into a food fence. Other ones, they're just coming out of the ground and they're way more nutritious than any lettuce you've ever purchased in your life. And they're free and they're perennials. So you can literally go out in your garden and you can just 
have free salads that are 10, 30, 40, 50 times more nutritious and they're grown without poisons. A friend of mine used to say, uh, most people think food comes from the grocery store. That's not really where it comes from. Right. It comes from the ground. Also, he would also say, other than growing your own food, everything else is a scam. Yeah, <laughs> That's what I like that. <laughs> so it is about the purest form of activity for for a, a a species to grow and pick their own food and eat it. It's, it's, it's peaceful a, it's, sedition. Oh, well, that's a good way to put it. What would this, um, now I'm going to get into the, you know, because I hear this and I think, what's this going to cost me? How am I going to, pay for this is this is this like so going to be so outrageously expensive to change over uh, i'm sure people are thinking that well what you know this is, is this something only well wealthy people can do uh properly or to you know how would you know how do, how do uh how do i address that if somebody says well yeah it's a good idea but you know i'm not paying for that right so if they're not paying for it in one way they're paying for it in another Right, the oh, healthcare alone. <laughs> Boom! Right, I mean, the odds of a family that eats one healthy meal a day getting cancer go down significantly. Right, so um, here's here's if you want to start a food forest, literally on no extra money, you can go to the store and you can buy papaya and tomatoes and cucumbers and all the different your favorite fruits and vegetables. You know, then you can eat your fruits and vegetables and save the seeds. And then you can turn those seeds into your food forest. So literally you don't have to, you have to put some thought into it, some design and some love, but you don't have to spend any money. Now in our service, we do backyard food forest blueprints, which is a very detailed document showing the exact layers of the soil, the layers of the food, the exact types of beneficial insect attractors, pollinator attractors, nitrogen fixers, and then all of the different support species and food producers, where they go, and we take into account shade, wind, water, and all the different elements of zone. And, and then boom, you've got a food forest blueprint for your yard. That's 797 for that document. That's nothing. No, the value is That's incredible. And, and you can, I could do this and just send you like a soil sample and uh, pictures of my backyard. Yes, we do videos and we are more concerned about building soil than what's existing. So if you already have uh, grass growing, if you have bushes of any kind, then you can support life. We build soil. That's the most important thing. So we use green manure plants, chop and drop plants, which you don't have to understand anything about. We teach that and it's very simple. Once you get the basic components of a food forest, it's, well, I'll give you an example. The Amazon rainforest was when the Incas and the Mayans were there, they designed the whole Amazon as a major community. And when they left, and a lot of people don't understand where they went, but when they left, it turned into the most biodiverse place on the planet. It's a designed food forest or a designed human community. Did not know that. I, see, I always learn stuff in these interviews, Love it. things I never knew. <laughs> and I'm glad that you're the guy that went out and figured all this stuff out along with the other people that preceded you and are bringing it to the world. Yes. You, you mentioned something that I was intrigued by it, a fence growing on a fence. Let's say I wanted to put a new fence up, which I'm about to do because it's falling down. Um, would I do wood? Would it be better to do another material? Would it, you know, would, would stucco and cement be wise? You know, what, just, just in terms of something that simple, what kind of fence would somebody put up? So I'll ask you a question back. So would you rather have a, a, a fence that looks either like wood or concrete or chain link, or would you rather have a green fence that just looks like it just blends into the jungle and provides an incredible amount of food? Well, uh, visually, the last one, of course. Yeah, right? And that's so yeah. easy to do. A fence is an element of a system that is like a trellis. Now you plant passion flower and grape vines and different types of vining plants. Once you train them up the fence, you let them go. Within two years, now you have a green food fence that can provide a lot of food for your family and beauty. 
So you're saying do it on a trellis. Uh, well, the, fo- the fence is the trellis. Yes. Now, what about noise and neighbors and uh, crime? <laughs> so, so, yeah, like, in other words, people stealing your grapes? Well, you know, coming into my house and my backyard and uh, people just being, you know, noise reduction because, I, you know, I have neighbors on both yeah. sides and in an alley behind my house. I have a lot of, you know, activity because I'm in a city, not, not like a super urban part of my city, but it's still a city. Yeah. So if you want to, if, and then there's a lot of good reasons nowadays to have barriers and to have those kind of barriers with everything going on. And I understand it. So maybe you do put up a wooden fence, a six foot tall wooden fence. You can still easily add little bars to it, little and little um, a trellis type of situation for very little. And you can train your vines and your growers up that. It'll still turn into a green fence, which will be more beautiful, which will help with the um, sound and of course the food production. So it's basically a double layered fence, one uh, conventional to uh, a protective barrier against the screaming hordes of chaos (laughs) (laughs) and then a beautiful forest inside of that yes tell me about hydroponics because i you know you i've heard about it for years and i know that people do it i don't understand it at all other than you don't need soil you just grow with water and nutrients is that correct yes it is so when i first learned about permaculture my mind always works. So, okay, how can we, what's the best way to market? What's the fastest thing to do? And so I sam, I tested out, I made very fancy greenhouses that had many applications, dehydration and hydroponics and aquaponics. And even we even had a solar electric light um, run on our solar panels, which were on top of the greenhouse. It was an electric bug zapper. And underneath the bug zapper, we had our fish tank. Right. So we would bug zap bugs into the fish tank and that's what they would eat. So my point with all that is hydroponics is great for some applications, but improving the soil and building soil is by far the, the best ROI because it's right there. You, we have to build soil. That's the foundation. Everything else that needs pumps and special gadgets and mechanics, like I said, it's, it's okay for some applications but nothing compares to the soil. Well, you know, there's another very uh, important factor in wanting to do this is food cost is absolutely outrageous in the last couple of years, in the last, well, even the last 10 years, but the last few years because of the pandemic, I, I'm assuming that food costs are, I can't even believe it. Sometimes I look at the prices of stuff and I'm like, how is this possible that, you know, this, um, uh, little thing of grapes is $5, yeah. you know, or maybe more. Yeah. Um, Especially when there could be grapes and avocados and everything we could grow those in our backyard so easily, you know, and, and it's part of the control grid. And that's what you just said is, is bringing that awareness to society is what we need to do. And it's happening. In fact, we launched on earth day just four months ago with that show on the highway. We are now in 15 countries and 40 states. We have TV show pilots coming out. Uh, we're doing one in, in, uh, in September, in three weeks from now, we're at a movie star's house. And we're going to be showing, demonstrating how easy this is relative to the current life we're living. That would be an awesome reality show because it would be real, for one. <laughs> it would actually be real. And it would be informational in a way that, could really bring a lot of change very simply to a lot of people. hundred so percent. I hope that's what, I hope that's what you're going for because that would be an amazing. Absolutely. We're going to change the world. Um, we are going to catalyze a shift in consciousness and help people see, you know, I think it was uh, jobs who said they're, you know, the people who are crazy enough to think that, that they can change the world are the ones who do Well, we are, and we're absolutely going to change the world. Thanks to, the pioneers that came before us, our job is to spread this message far and wide because this is the answer. Stuff that was sort of starting to happen in the late 60s and the 70s. And I it just seemed to have, have seems to have gone away a lot. And now it's coming back out of absolute pure necessity. Yes. I mean, more back then was we're headed in the wrong direction. Now we know we've gone in the wrong direction. We know it. We see it. Anybody who's 
got got any type of observational abilities can see that the the way that things are set up isn't working it's a it's a you know um how did you put it it was something about a centralized food system yeah. is that what you how you said it yes centralization is the problem because government takes advantage of centralization they take advantage of that control aspect but the freedom is simply decentralized simply grow food instead of lawns and, and we, we win our our health and abundance at every level I think maybe even in Europe, it's they're a little bit more open to this stuff, from what I can tell. There's um, they've kicked Monsanto out of a number of countries. Yeah. I remember being I was in um, I was working in um, Moscow like uh, ten years, five, six, seven years ago, on a TV project, and um, there was a guy who said, "I want to, can I get you some apples?" And I go, "Sure." He goes, "Well, they don't look." the way the apples you're used to looking, there's bruises on them, but there's no pesticides because we can't afford them here. <laughs> Good. But they're, they're, they're far more delicious. And he went and bought me this bag of apples that were, you know, he didn't even, it didn't cost much, you know, it was like nothing, you know, hardly anything. And they were great. Yeah. They were great. And I was like, why can't we just do this? Why do I have to walk into a supermarket and see perfectly round, not perfectly round, but, perfectly you no know, bruises with a wax sort of thing across it uh, the top that uh, you can't wash off even <laughs> and mother nature is 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 knows what she's doing mother nature is so efficient that when a food is ripe on the vine it's going to be more nutrient dense it's going to look better smell better and taste better but yet we pick our fruits sometimes a month ahead of time in costa rica where i live for 12 years they would pick the bananas completely green and then they would spray them right before they got on the truck with this chemical to turn them yellow. So then two days later, when they got to the store to be sold, they were turning yellow ahead of their natural process. So in every way, what I'm talking about is going to be better for society. It's gonna taste better. It's gonna be smell better. It's gonna be, and, and also this idea that there's bugs, like these, these topics like weeds. There's no such thing as a weed in nature. Weeds are pioneers like dandelions. When I was a kid, I was growing up and we had this perfect lawn and some dandelions were popping up. And I said, look at the beautiful flower. I think I was like seven. And I remember my parents saying, oh, those are weeds. Those are horrible. And, and I knew that that was wrong. I'm like, no, I don't think so. <laughs> All right. <laughs> you know, and, and there's always a, a reason for a certain plant and yet, what do the marketers do? And what do the poison manufacturers and distributors do? They turn that into a marketing opportunity to say, that's a bad plant and here's how you kill it. It's amazing how much stuff is being produced to kill stuff that grows naturally. That's yeah. very strange. Yes. I always liked dandelions when I was a kid. They're the best medicine. They're incredible. I think I was told not to, you know, when they get... Um, you can blow the spores off the top and it's kind of this cool thing that goes into the wind. And I was told, don't do that because it'll, it'll spread more of the uh, dandelions. These are plants that have been given to us by some divine source of everything that have been proven to benefit us on so many levels. And yet those are the plants that are illegal and the plants that are actually killing, not plants, the synthesized chemicals that are actually killing millions of people per year and pretty soon a lot more than that, are the ones that are even mandated by our society. Yeah, it's an interesting thing, especially the, the plants that um, expand uh, consciousness in some way, yeah. or at least mimic that. Uh, you know, <laughs> I can't say exactly what happens. I mean, I've, I've experimented with a few of them, and I, I'm not, I don't have any regrets about it. That's for sure. Right. I'm like, well, there's something going on here um, that's, you know, it's like if you can also, if you can not only control the food, but if you can control people's um, thoughts and keep them limited to your um, eventual needs uh, or wants, not needs, desires, then that's another control issue we could get into at some point. But <laughs> yeah. um, uh, it's like, why, you know, uh, why are we going after that stuff? Uh, why is anybody going after that? It's that's just right. because it's like, well, we can't have people thinking this stuff. <laughs> <laughs> then they'll question what I'm doing and, you know, go, hey, stop.
You nailed it. I believe the contrast in society pushes us to ask new questions. And I think this is the apocalypse, the great unveil, the lifting of the veil. And all of these things are happening and it, it's a magical time. There's a lot of suffering, but there doesn't need to be the suffering. The fear is another one of the foundational control tool, tools of the government day, right? They're always promoting fear. We have to raise above that. There's no amount of suffering that I can feel that will help anybody be free. So I have to raise my own vibration and be inspired and show people a way that inspires them and lifts them out of their pain and suffering so then they can inspire. It's really exciting to see what's happening. Well, what you're doing essentially is on a, the, the most basic level is empowering and handing people a solution to take control of their own situation yes and not be a victim of um things that that um they're allowing to control them in certain ways yeah. there's um there's a lot of uh there's a lot of mental energy positive mental energy that comes from healthy eating that if you take that away then you're also um diminishing the power of of individuals it, you know i noticed that when i stopped eating um well let's use mcdonald's for example which is was a billion years ago i quit eating it but i yeah. <laughs> I, I i'm going to tell you this this is kind of embarrassing i was 22 years old um pretty you know a young man vibrant uh but uh, you know i thought vibrant but i was eating mcdonald's and you know, do, uh, Coca-Cola and all that stuff. I got cellulite at age, um, I'm a, a guy with cellulite at age 22. I saw it on my stomach. And, and I remember this woman said to me, what's going on there? I you got cellulite. And I'm like, that's impossible. I'm a 22 year old guy. And I realized at that point, like something is making this happen. And I was eating, you know, I was eating like crap. I mean, I was really, you know, it was the convenience foods. Yeah, yeah. And I went, I better start looking around and seeing what what am I doing? Now, it was a very slow process, very slow, and which is fine. It just took what it took. And um, I had to change a number of things um, besides food. But that was a big that was a big moment. Uh, if you're 22 and you've got cellulite, you might want to think about <laughs> yeah, what, what you're putting in there. Yes. Oh, I got to speak to this because what you're, you're touching on is so important to talk to it, with our society, right? We are the sickest we've ever been. Humanity is finally, you know, everybody's lifespan was going up, 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 up and up for the last forever. And now it's going down again, right? And it's because of the poisons and the non-foods that we're eating, these so-called convenience foods. So about four weeks ago, I did a three-day fast. After listening, I've been planning on doing this for like 10 or 15 years. And I just thought I'll do it next week or next year or next month. All of a sudden, I listened to this guy talk about, it. he's a doctor, um, the Indian fella, and he blew my mind. I started that minute. I'm like, I'm done. I'm doing it right now. So I started drinking a lot of water and I did a three day, didn't eat anything. I played tennis for four hours, um, the second day and the third day, right? So, I mean, I'm very, very active. I never played tennis so well in my life as the third day of not eating anything. So what has happened, and then my wife did, I told her about it, she did it. Both of us, it changed our lives. We literally now look at food different. It's a consciousness thing. Um, and by the way, when you do do a fast, you will start, your body will burn up the cancer cells and the malignant and all the cells that are not normal. That's the first thing that your body will eat up, right? So there's so much value into consciously eating. Look at your food. And in fact, I did this the other day. I wanted to stay up late and I bought this um, poisonous double espresso from a particular high brand. And I looked at that on the counter about an hour later, and I, I asked myself, will that make me feel good or bad? And my body knew. I went, Ugh. Then two hours later, I didn't throw it away yet. Two hours later, I asked the same question. I looked at that can. I said, 
Will that make me feel good or bad? And I got a gag reflex. I went and opened and dumped it in the sink. It's amazing when you stop doing certain things, if you can't, you can't even come back to them because they have a whole, you have a different reaction. I remember taking my television out of, a, out of an apartment I lived in for, for uh, oh, it was well over a year. It might've been even two. And I, then I got a, I got a TV and I turned it on and it was the strangest, creepiest, weirdest thing. I, I, I was like, I can't even believe I watched this for so many years. No, I, I still watch TV, but it's rare. Yeah. Um, but it had that effect. And I was interviewing, I can't remember who it was. And he was talking about how he had changed his food and he had some friends over and they bought, um, they had some soup that they had gotten at a health food store. And it was supposedly, you know, let's, let's say it was called healthy, you know, paradise Valley soup. And it had all the, you know, organic everything. And he said, but he goes, I heated it up and I took a taste and it was too salty for me because I couldn't eat it because he had been off of salt for so long yeah. that it, 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 it had become completely distasteful to him because salt, salt equal to sugar in terms of its uh, damage from what I've been reading and experiencing myself. Right. Right. Now there's different types of salt, right? There's salts that are made with poisons and that are um, very processed. The Himalayan sea salt is something that with the fast, I would put just a pinch in water a couple times a day. And because it, a fasting is uncomfortable at times, but yeah, all the, <laughs> right? it sure is. <laughs> but here's the amazing part is it wasn't the hunger. It, it, I was not hungry in that way. I was just vibrating in a different way. And at times my body was purging. And I saw a little Himalayan sea salt with all the minerals in there and water. And I little slight headache I had went away in 10 minutes. No, but the oh, okay. act of, of silencing our minds and looking at the food and asking ourselves, will that benefit me right now? If everybody just did that one thing and then listen to the answer, let the body tell you the answer, boom, you're going to be healthy. Well, that's an interesting point. And that's true of almost everything, you know, in addition to food is if you ask yourself that question, is this going to make me feel better or worse? And, you know, the body does know if you're just, you you don't have to be some kind of magically tuned in person. You just have to listen. I guess the real issue comes in, well, it won't, but I'm going to do it anyway. (laughs) But that's the helps. Asking helps, but then you go, yeah, I know it's not the best, but I'm going <laughs> to. I think um, that's the habit of not asking. Like that's the, when I ask and I get the message, that's it. But, but if I just am in the habit of eating out of boredom or any other emotional reason, then, then whatever, then all bets are off. Right. Yeah. Well, I have that even with like hanging out with certain people. Is this going to make me feel better or worse? You know, and then if you say, well, it'll make me feel worse, but I'm lonely. Yeah. Well, maybe you're supposed to be lonely because you you go from lonely to worse. That's that. Now you've got two problems. Yes, for sure. <laughs> I like that though. That's like, I'm going to do that more when I, should I hire this person? <laughs> <laughs> That's a good one. So your business is out of Florida then. That's where you're, you're based. That's where I'm personally based, but we've now got an international team. We just had an amazing investor reach out who's got um, companies all over the world with over 400 employees. And he said, Jim, this is the most important business in the world. My resources are your resources. Whoa, I love that. Let's, let's tell people how to find uh, you on your website because it, it's a great website. I just went there myself uh, and looked through the whole thing. It's very explained beautifully. Lay, it's a great layout, and you totally understand what Jim is doing when you go to this. So let's uh, let's give the folks a, a way to find you. Okay, so foodforestabundance.com is the website, and uh, my personal email is jimpgale at gmail.com. That's J I M P is in Patrick G A L E at gmail.com. Um, and yeah, I'm very accessible. My whole team, we're all about empowering people to grow food, to inspire and then empower. And it, like I said, it's, it's going absolutely global and it, it's a lot of fun.
I hear a child screaming or a screen door. My two-year-old. I'm t- I put <laughs> mute on the darn thing because my two-year-old must have woke up. I love it. I I just I I love hearing kids express themselves because that's their job. Yeah, me. Ah! <laughs> you know, <laughs> it's great because yeah. there's no filter at that age, and so you know humans are very honest at that age. Yeah. Um, and then they start figuring out how to manipulate their parents. Right. Oh, she's been working on that since pretty early. <laughs> she's a tyrant. Now it's it. <laughs> <laughs> I found it. I find it interesting that your last name is Gale, which is like a force, a wind. A, so that's what you are. Yeah, so and, and I, don't know. I, I love playing with that as well. Words are a lot of fun to me. Is to, to break down words and see how I can adapt. And what I've been working on is building my energy and my force, so power, so I can inspire more people. Um, and the business is, is very inspiring on every level. In fact, I'll give you a, a detail that I think will inspire some of your folks. It's like landscaping, except for it's functional landscaping. And it's very profitable. If you want to be in the business of helping people be prepared, helping people grow food, it is the most important business in the world right now. It's literally the business of freedom. So we've created the pet platform and our mission is to serve the cooperative. And the cooperative are the people who are on the ground meeting with customers and putting food in their yards. So is that an actual business opportunity for people that are listening to this? Big time. We have people, we've had signed three contracts today um, of people around the world who are joining the Food Forest Cooperative. And then we provide the platform. We've got the design team. We've got 18 people that they're making their life out of designing the future, the sustainable, regenerative future of our society. So people come to us. We start with a food forest blueprint, and then we hand the package off to the local co-op installer. And the installer goes, meets with them, um, finds the nurseries and the suppliers, and then installs their food forest. Wow. Do you have it going on in Los Angeles? We have several customers in Los Angeles, and I believe... We just had somebody two or three days ago, but obviously Los Angeles can have 20, 30, 40, 50 food forest installers and everybody could be very busy. Absolutely. Right. It's, I mean, the climate is great. There's, there is, you know, land need, yeah. and need and, and need. Well, of course we have a huge need. And I think there's a, I'd like to think there's an open mindedness to uh, trying something like this. Yeah. Oh, it's going nuts. And we're still at the tip of the iceberg because most people don't know yet that the food supply chain is being systematically destroyed and on, on the short term and the long term. So as people start filling in on the why, then, I mean, we've got people coming to us every day saying my business just mandated something that I do not agree with. I have to find a new job. Boom. We have it. It's a job that's regenerative and beneficial to every layer. It's, I like to call it regenerative capitalism. We don't need rulers. The most dangerous superstition is our belief in authority and for us not to be the authors of our own lives. So that's all these things we teach in our, in our business model. I always say, uh, I wouldn't want, I don't like to be, um, ruled by somebody who wants to be a ruler. Right. <laughs> right. There's something about wanting that job that is immediately makes the person suspect not that there aren't some very benevolent, caring people that that go for that. Uh, I'm not. I'm not saying every single person that wants that is 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 horrible, but there's plenty of them. Yeah. Uh, and you know, the minimal, a minimal amount of guidance. Not not probably not a bad idea. Somebody knows more than me. Like you would guide me in this field because I recognize that you know more. Yeah. I have no problem going. Oh, teach me. Right. Then you're saying which is really fantastic. Yes, I'll teach you, but then you can run with it too. And then you can teach others and I'm done with you now because you could, you've got the power. Yeah. We have um, priorities or values and the most important value to everything we're doing is freedom and independence for society. Right. And second, we also have to have a sustainable business model. And we do. Um, we've done over 300 grand the first three months of business from launch. Like it's going, it's really, really fun and doing well. 
So you're when did you launch? Is it, this is April twenty first. Old of a business. Four months. What is it? Oh boy, I'm really in on the ground floor of this. Yeah. I mean, you know, at least getting the information out. I'm. Oh, I feel good about myself now. <laughs> <laughs> you too, buddy. Thank you. Oh, yeah. Well, thanks so much for talking to me, Jim. And and good luck. And folks, visit the website. Things are changing in a way that this is very important work Jim is doing, and um, you can be a part of it. Please. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks, Jim. I really appreciate right. your time. Thank you, Bob. You have a great day and thanks everybody for listening. Appreciate you guys listening to The Exploding Human. Hope you enjoyed the episode. Big, big thanks to Jim Gale. Much success to Jim and his company. Check out the website, theexplodinghuman.com, The Exploding Human with Bob Nickman on YouTube and our Exploding Human Facebook page. Big appreciation to all you guys out there. Have a wonderful day. Thank you.